The Senator President, uh, from uh, West Virginia, Mr. Byrd, is recognized for one hour. Mr. President, I thank the Chair. Mr. President, this is the tenth in my series of speeches on the line item veto. Last week, I spoke of the proscriptions of Sulla From Asia, Sulla had announced to the Senate his victories and his treaty with Mithridates, and it made no mention of personal grievances or revenge. However, after he had left Ephesus and crossed over to Greece and had reached the shore of the Adriatic, his tone changed. He sent a second message to the Senate, recapitulating the services that he had rendered to his country and the rewards that he had received for those services. His property confiscated, his friends assassinated, and himself voted a public enemy. He was now coming, he said, in order that his enemies and the enemies of the Republic should receive the punishment due for their crimes. Sulla's return to Rome was a sanguinary one. The battle at the Colin, Colin Gate had been desperate and bloody. And the fighting had lasted all day long and throughout the entire night. The Samnite army, whose lines of retreat had been cut, was destroyed. And the battlefield heaped with corpses, had grudgingly yielded up the victory to Sulla and his v veterans. On the day after the battle, Sulla was haranguing the Senate. At the very moment that 6,000 Samnite and Lucanian prisoners were perishing under the sword. Suddenly the death cries were heard. Senators were struck with astonishment, but Sulla, with a firm and unaltered countenance, continued his discourse and bade the senators to pay attention to what he was saying. For the noise, he said, was coming only from some malefactors whom he had ordered to be chastised. The bloody battle at the Colin Gate had ended all effective resistance in Italy. Now a reign of terror began. And Sulla posted proscription lists of intended victims who were to be hunted down like animals, murdered, and a price set upon their heads. Many victims had already perished. When Gaius Metellus ventured to rise in the Senate and to question Sulla as to when this vengeance might be expected to stop, Sulla answered that he did not know. Then uh, implored Metellus, let us know whom thou intendest to destroy. Sulla said that he would do it. 
Plutarch tells us that Sulla then immediately posted a list of the names of 80 citizens. On the following day, he proscribed 220 more. And on the third day, as many more. Sulla then announced that he had completed the list of all those whose names he remembered. And that those whose names he had forgotten as he remembered the names, they must enter some future proscription list. Even the dead were not spared of Sulla's vengeance. The corpse of Marius, the conqueror of the Cimbri and the Teutons, was exhumed and decapitated and given up to insults and then cast contemptuously into the Anio or the Anienus river. That the repose of the grave might be denied him. From these proscriptions, the equestrians had suffered especially. Appian, the historian, tells us that uh, 15 ex-consuls, 90 senators, and 2,600 knights or equestrians had already been the victims of the proscriptions. But the proscription did not end with the death of the victims. It also struck at their posterity to the third generation. And not only were the sons and grandsons denied any paternal inheritance, but they were declared unworthy ever to fill any public office. The two consuls uh, being dead, Sulla then had himself appointed by an interrex, Valerius Flaccus, to the office of dictator for an unlimited term. Sulla, before he had left Asia, had requested of his friends in the Senate that a law be passed permitting the appointment of a dictator for an unlimited term, entirely without precedent. And so this appointment carried with it the, all of the rights of all of the magist magistrates. And he was appointed uh, to an unlimited term in late 82 BC for the purpose of enacting legislation and reconstituting the government. Sulla increased the number of senators from 300, the figure at which it had stood for over 400 years, to 600. And he appointed uh, many of his own supporters, especially from among the equestrians. And as a consequence, the appointees to the Senate were beholden to Sulla. 
He then uh, took away the traditional rights of the tribunes. They no longer had the right to introduce legislation. And he revised the uh, composition of juries to again exclude equestrians, but to include senators. Mr. President, uh, Sola indubitably did not aim at a dictatorship for life. After he had restored Republican, quote unquote, government under senatorial control. He abdicated his power in stages, resigning from the dictatorship at the end of 81 BC, being consul in 80, and uh, returning to the state status of a private citizen without office in 79, retiring to his campaigning estate. Sulla died the next year in 78 BC at the age of 60. He composed his own epitaph. No friend ever did me so much good or enemies so much harm, but I repaid him with interest. After Sulla's death in 78 BC, Roman history moved around the names of a small group of eminent men whose ambitions and rivalries were given free reign by the already supine and increasingly feeble authority wielded by an indolent Senate. The generation of Marius and Sulla had seen the organization and effective use of a professional army. As the basis of political power in the state and in the provinces. Mr. President, time uh, precludes me from mention of the several wars being waged in this period, with the exception of certain conflicts involving the most imminent men. Mithridates the sixth, Jupiter the Great, king of Pontus, had made uh, peace with Sulla in 85 BC. Realizing that Sulla made peace only to accommodate his own early return to Italy where he had some Senna and Carbo, Mithridates prepared for a renewal of the struggle with Rome. He defended himself against attack in 83 and 82 by the Roman general Lucius Licinius Murina, Murina. But again, Sulla brought about a cessation of the hostilities. In 75 BC, 
the king of Bithynia. Nicomedes III died after bequeathing to Rome his kingdom. After the Senate had accepted the kingdom and made it into a new province, Mithridates disputed its possession and invaded Bithynia. In early 74 BC, where he was confronted with the Roman consul Marcus Aurelius Cotta, whom he defeated. In this third Mithridatic War, a Roman general by the name of Lucius Licinius Lucullus defeated Mithridates on land and on sea, recovered Bithynia, and invaded Pontus. Mithridates' kingdom, thus forcing Mithridates to take refuge with his son-in-law, the king of Armenia, Tigranes. For the next two years, uh, Lucullus completed the subjugation of Pontus, but he could not end the war as long as Mithridates was at large. He therefore demanded the, sur the surrender of Mithridates by Tigranes, whose refusal of the, of the demand uh, resulted in an invasion of Armenia by Lucullus. Lucullus defeated Tigranes and tried to uh, completely subjugate Armenia, but he was prevented from doing so because of the mutinous conduct of his own troops, who were displeased because Lucullus protected the subject peoples from the excesses. from their excesses. And also because Lucullus enforced strict discipline upon his troops. You can see why he won these many battles. He enforced discipline among his troops, but they didn't like it. So uh, this caused him to be inactive and finally uh, through the machinations of his enemies in Rome, Lucullus was deprived of the command in 66 BC. While Lucullus had been pursuing Mithridates in Asia Minor, Nius Pompeius Magnus, Pompey the Great, was fighting uh, Quintus Sertorius in Spain. And as if two wars were not enough, a serious slave insurrection occurred in Italy. In 73 BC, Spartacus, a Roman slave and gladiator from Thrace, broke out of the gladiatorial school at Capua with 70 of his fellow gladiators. And he quickly collected more than 10,000 adherents and took refuge on Mount Vesuvius. He then vanquished the Roman forces that were sent against him by Varinius Glaber and Publius Valerius, after which his army swelled to a number of 70,000 and eventually reached 
as many as 120,000. Rome then sent both consuls against Spartacus, and after defeating their legions, he sacrificed 300 Roman prisoners. This formidable war, this war, although it had been uh, ridiculed in the beginning as being nothing but a raid, plundering, and robbery, had now been going on into his third year. Marcus Licinius Crassus was elected praetor. His uh, surname was Dives. You remember the name in the Bible? Dives? Well, Crassus bore the surname Davies because of his great wealth. He advanced against Spartacus with six new legions. After arriving at his destination, he received two additional legions that had been defeated under the previous consul. Upon the receipt of the two additional legions, he immediately decimated them, killing every tenth man as punishment for their bad performance in the battles they had lost against Spartacus. Immediately upon Crassus' demonstrating to his army that they had more to fear from him than they did from the enemy, he overcame 10,000 Spartacans and then advanced boldly against Spartacus himself, vanquished him in a brilliant engagement, and pursued his fleeing forces to the sea where they attempted to pass over to Sicily. In a uh, pitched battle that was long and bloody, Spartacus, with a great mass of those of his followers, were surrounded by the forces of Crassus and slain. Crassus, therefore, had won a great victory over the slave rebels. Meanwhile, in Spain, Marcus Viaino Properna, having treacherously uh, assassinated Sertorius and take, having taken over his command, himself was disastrously defeated. He was taken prisoner and executed by Pompey, thus bringing an end to the war in Spain in the year uh, 71 BC, the same year in which Crassus had triumphed over the slave rebels. Both uh, Pompey and uh, Crassus, flushed now by their victories, respectively in Spain and Italy, demanded triumphs and also requested to be permitted to stand candidates for the consulship. Cassius was eligible. Uh, Crassus. Crassus was eligible. But uh, Pompey was still under the, the age limit. He also did not qualify because he had not previously held the offices of questorship and praetorship. Both Pompey and uh, 
crisis. However, having uh, maintained their men under arms, the Senate was overawed and yielded, giving both men their triumph and uh, approving the passage of a law exempting Pompey from the legal requirements of his uh, candidacy. Both Pompey and Crassus then put aside their personal rivalries and supported each other to the fullest for the consulship, and they were both elected. They immediately went to work and overturned the sullen constitution, restoring to the tribunes their traditional rights, including the right the power of the veto. They revised the uh, senatorial list to include their own adherents and also revised the composition of the juries this time to uh, provide that the equestrians as well as the senators could sit on the jury. Both Pompey and Sulla had declined uh, appointments in the provinces following their term as consul, because there were no provinces available that offered them the opportunity to augment their military and political reputation. Subsequently, however, Pompey was given the opportunity. By virtue of the ravages of the Cilician pirates, whose depredations upon the shipping had interrupted the importation into Rome of grain, bringing on the serious threat of a famine and requiring decisive measures. In 67 BC, a Roman tribune by the name of Aulus, A -U -L -U -S, Aulus Gabinius, introduced legislation appointing to a single commander with all the powers of a consul, the authority over the whole sea within the pillars of Hercules and over all Roman territory to a distance of 50 miles inland. The appointment with Imperium to last for three years. The Senate bitterly resisted this legislation, but it was enacted with the support of Cicero. Marcus Tullius Cicero. And also with the support of a, of a rising young noble named Gaius Julius Caesar. The opinion of the people was such that the Senate had to appoint Pompey. Pompey immediately set to work uh, energetically and systematically and in 40 days had swept the pirates from the western Mediterranean and in 49 more had cornered them in Cilicia and forced the surrender of their strongholds. Therefore, within three months, Pompey had brought to a triumphant conclusion the pirate war, but he still had 33 months to run with respect to uh, his appointment with Imperium. And so he uh, was eager to gather fresh laurels. The opportunity was not uh, want wanting. If we recall that the uh, 
conclusion of the pirate war coincided uh, with uh, the check of Roman arms in Pontus and Armenia that had been brought about by the mutinous conduct of Lucullus's soldiers and the machination of Lucullus's enemies in Rome. So Pompey sought Lucullus's command. Here was another opportunity for glory, military glory. So the Senate uh, strongly opposed any extension of Pompey's authority. But with Cicero's support, the game, legislation was enacted and Pompey received Lucullus's command. And he departed to his new duties. Tigranes reached terms with Lucullus. And uh, Mithridates, the able and courageous king of Pontus, and his life, the story of his life is a fascinating one. He was beset by a mutiny led by his own son, Pharnaces II. And he was trapped in, he was trapped in his own citadel. at Pantocopium. Pantocopium is located in the Crimea where Kerch, K-E-R-C-H, is now located on the strait connecting the Sea of Azov with the Black Sea. Mithridates attempted to commit suicide with poison, but he had been taking small doses of poison for several years and he was therefore immune to the poison. And so he had himself put to death by a mercenary. And with the death of Mithridates, the several Mithridatic wars came to an end. Pompey had conquered a vast territory. And he had created a belt, a continuous belt of Roman provinces along the coasts of the Black and the Caspian Seas, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Roman provinces extending as far south as Syria and Judea. He then prepared for a triumphal return with his victorious troops to Italy. This was in 62 BC. Now, Mr. President, let's go back two years, see what's, what was happening in Italy while, Myth while uh, Pompey was fighting in Asia Minor with Mithridates and Tigranes. In 64 BC, 
three men ran as candidates for the consulship. Lucius Sergius Catalina, or Catalina, Gaius Antonius, and Marcus Tullus Cicero. Antonius and Cicero were uh, elected. In 63, the consular elections for the next year were held, and again, Catiline ran, and he was again defeated, he being bitterly opposed by Cicero and the business interests and most senators because they distrusted his motives. Catiline was uh, not a man to take uh, two uh, defeats easily. He was a vindictive man and of a rebellious nature. Therefore, while Gaius Manlius, an associate of his, was collecting a large force of men under arms in Etruria, Caroline with contention and malice formed a conspiracy in Rome against the government. The plan was to assassinate Cicero, create acts of arson around the, and throughout the city, and occupy strategic points with armed men who would take over the government. Gaius Celestius Crispus, a Roman historian who lived during the years 86 to 34 BC, was a contemporary of this event. And he writes that among the uh, conspirators was a man named uh, Quintus Curtius. C U R T I U S. Whom the censor had expelled from the Senate for bad conduct. Curtius had a lady friend whose name was Fulvia. And when he found himself less in favor with her because lack of means compelled him to be less lavish with his gifts, He suddenly began to talk big and promise her the earth. The next moment, threatening to stab her unless she complied with his demands. Well, this high and mighty tone was so unlike his normal manner that Fulvia insisted upon an explanation. And upon dis discovering that there was a conspiracy, she decided that this was such a dire threat to Rome that it should not be concealed. And all of the facts, therefore, were communicated to Cicero. Cicero developed enough e evidence to uh, induce the Senate to adopt a decree empowering him take all necessary measures to save the state. This was a senatus consultum ultimum, the declaration of a state emergency. He then proceeded to have uh, five of the leading accomplices of Catiline arrested. And instead of leaving the matter to the regular courts, he convened the Senate to decide the fate of the five prisoners. And the Senate, after a very strong speech by Marcus Portius Cato Atacensus the Younger, 
decreed that the uh, conspirators be executed. Cicero, believing that it was best not to wait until nightfall, lest uh, an attempt be made by the conspirators during the interval, immediately, personally, conducted the condemned men to a chamber within the prison, which was about 12 feet below the ground and enclosed in walls of stone, in walls of stone. And along with uh, Publius Cornelius Lentulus Assura and Gaius Cornelius Cethegus, both of whom were senators, Gabinius and Statilius and Siparius met death at the hands of the executioner on December 5, 63 B.C. Well, Catiline uh, now realized that it would be futile to march on Rome, and so he attempted to escape with his army into Cisalpine Gaul. But he was caught between two Roman armies, the armies uh, commanded by Gaius Antonius and uh, Quintus Cecilius Metellus Sealer, C E. A bitter and violent battle ensued with heavy losses on both sides. Sallust, or Celestius, tells us that Catiline and his men fought with such ferocity and daring that practically every man was found dead upon the battle station that he had occupied before the battle began. Catiline, defiant as ever, was found at the head of his troops. Thus ended the Catalinian uh, conspiracy in 62 B.C. Mr. President, also in 62 B.C., the Roman Senate trembled when it heard that Pompey, with his well-seasoned, well-equipped army, had landed at Brundisium. On the eastern, on the heel of the boot of Italy, and was on his way to Rome. With an army of men who were devoted personally to Pompey and who were capable, at his word, of making him dictator, he was at the apex of his power. But Pompey relieved the fears of the Senate by voluntarily disbanding his army before he entered the city. Now the Senate no longer feared Pompey because he had disbanded his troops. And uh, the ungrateful Senate rejected his request for land for his veterans and for ratification of the agreements that he had made in Asia Minor while he was subjecting kingdoms and peoples to the control of Rome. As a result, Pompey and Crassus and other capitalists were thrown into a flirtation with the uh, populares. And so, in the year 60 B.C., a milestone of history, Pompey and Crassus 
the richest man in Rome. And Julius Caesar, soon to rise to preeminence, reached an informal arrangement of power sharing known as the First Triumvirate. Mr. President, uh, the Roman Republic had been in existence now 693 years, lacking seven years being seven centuries. It had only a few more years to run until its final collapse. The death rattle in its throat was not yet audible. But its vital signs had shown serious deterioration since the time of Tiberius Gracchus. Now, dominant individuals, helped by their supporters, struggled for power and prestige. and military glory. The incessant civil wars and wars in the provinces that I've mentioned today and uh, in my speech last week had extracted a terrible toll from the population of all Italy. And the price in blood and treasure was to flow through many generations. The vanishing peasantry from the land, the declining family and religious values, the fading away of the old Roman virtues, a growing slave economy, Power politics, graft, and greed, and venality, and corruption in government. High unemployment and growing indolence had contributed to the swelling city mob. All of these were the signs as well as the elements of the creeping but certain decay. Of the Republic. Through it all, Mr. President. a weakened Senate. Once the resplendent and supreme pillar of power undergirding the rugged yet graceful architecture of the Roman Republic had lost its way 
had lost its nerve, its vision, and its independence. The Roman Senate, for so many centuries, the pride of the Republic had failed at the critical junctures to demonstrate the firmness, the considered judgment, and the integrity that might not only have arrested, but might also have reversed the decline of the Republic. As of the year 60 BC, the year of the first triumvirate, the Senate possibly could even yet arrest and reverse the decline. But would it? But now you the floor. I suggest the absence of reform. The clerk will call over.